This is the Stop Time Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Hopkins, and I'm here to engage you in thought-provoking motivational conversations around practicing the art of living in the moment. I'm a certified life coach, and I'm excited to dig deep and offer insights into embracing who we are and where we are at. So my next guest is known for originating roles in several productions on Broadway and off, including The Telephone Guy and the award-winning The Band's Visit opposite Tony Shaloub, Charles Revson opposite Patti Lupone and Christine Ebersol in Warpaint, and Clopin, King of the Gypsies in The Hunchback of Notre Dame. He has been the recipient of the Helen Hayes Ovation Garland and Connecticut Critics Circle Awards, among others, and his onstage work has been reviewed as a showcase of sheer star power. Television work include some roles in Modern Family, Martin Scorsese's Vinyl and Unforgettable, and he helped to develop and guest star in the series finale of Amazon's Transparent. He has also contributed to numerous books, uh, including Performance of the Century and with his father, Wisdom from an Empty Mind and Luminous Life, How the Science of Light Unlocks the Art of Living. His masterclass series, Bridge to Broadway, earned him a 2020 Encore Award from the Actors Fund. And it is really my great pleasure to introduce you to Eric Lieberman. Welcome, Eric. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here with you and with all of your listeners. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know what? I have really been looking forward to speaking with you today. And with your permission, I'd really like to start with a question that's been on my mind. Sure. Although I'm connected to most of my guests in some way through either a referral or a previous professional relationship, what brought you and I together here today is neither of those. And so from my point of view, the fact that we are here together right now, it, it demonstrates that you have an openness and a willingness to connect. And I'm so curious to know what intrigued you enough to share this time with me today. Well, it was the big broadcast, yes, that appeared in the sky when your email arrived. <laughs> I think that the listening practice is the most important. And listening, of course, with, with not only the five senses, but beyond them. And um, our job is to show up in alignment with purpose. And so I feel that whatever comes my way is an invitation to step into larger purpose and that all that comes for me is toward the good. So you consequently are part of that destiny. And that's why we're here together. Mm. That's beautiful. You know, it's funny because I, I'm not sure how you came to me. <laughs> I'm not and sure how you came to me either. <laughs> it, it, it's so funny. And, and you, know, you know, having sort of done a little research on you after you came to me, um, I was sort of struck by, well, of course. There is a, an yeah. inevitability mm. about things these days. Yeah. So I just toss it up to that. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good to me. So when, when I was uh, looking around, I was struck by something you said on your website. Do you mind if I share it? Please. Yeah. So you said, um, ultimately, I think our job as artists is to share the secrets of our heart so that others may be set free, saving our own lives so others can save theirs. Tell me a little more about that. Oh, that's a good one. Thanks for picking that one out. Yeah. Um, I would say that as a young person, my experience was marked by parallel um, observations. One being, I knew I was here for a reason. And that was in place before I even arrived. I felt that from the very youngest moments of my memory. So that was in place. But there was also a great amount of emotional tumult and circumstances which <laughs> threw me to and fro. And, uh, and sometimes not a lot of external validation for that sense of purpose. Uh, through those darker days, I was inspired by artists who gave me the courage to live, either directly by, by extending hand in mentorship or friendship to me saying, keep going, young one, or through their performances, which made me feel less alone in the world. And I found that with the courage to do the work, to survive, and then to live in a more graceful state, as one hopes to, uh, meaning to rise from the 
mechanics of survival into something a bit more inspired. One can, uh, in effect, become inspiring because years later, young people would come to me at stage doors and say, something you said made me literally one said something you said made me not want to take my life. Uh, I'm going to come out to my parents. I know that I'm, you know, not living in sin. And there are variations of this which come to me through students I work with and those who sometimes attend performances when we were doing that. And that to me is an, uh, the ultimate uh, testament to having faith in one's blueprint and then doing the work also to um, address and alchemize the tumult, mm. which threatened one's desire to be here in physical form. So in other words, it took a while for body and soul to come together, but once they do, purpose comes online, and then you hear that echoed back to you through those who witness it. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's, it's so interesting to me, you mentioned validation. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about how, how, if it's changed at all, the definition of validation has changed for you from that Absolutely. time to now. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, it's no news to any of us that we're living in uh, a culture that is specifically designed in many ways to pull us from center and to make us believe um, that the next product or TV show or boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever is going to make us whole and that we are ostensibly broken pieces in search of completion. And that's, that's the, uh, marketing model because if you didn't think you needed something why would you buy it is really mm. the the, the fear-based underpinning of that mm. capitalistic drive so um a number of things contributed to the um reversal of that or, or at least the mitigation of that i mean one is meditation because mm. in meditation one identifies more with the background than the passing fancy of that which appears to be the solution. Louise Hay, the late great Louise Hay, has mm. a wonderful talk on YouTube about how to love yourself, which if you asked me about this five, even six years ago, I would have thought you were kidding. And what kind of narcissism is this? But I realized as actors in particular, we ask for a lot. But as my friend Tanya Pinkin says, if you can't accept a compliment, how can you accept an Oscar? And most actors can't actually receive a love or a thank you or a compliment. And yet we want the big approbation at the Academy Award winning level. Um, so once I started to realize that it was an inside job and that if I couldn't say I love and appreciate you and I'm going to get you through the night to myself, then no person or thing or, or accolade could fulfill that. Everything changes. I look in the mirror now, and even though inside I still feel extremely young, the outside gets older. And our type may change, how we're viewed by the world may change, whatever it is. But I'm interested in what's unchanging. Your question is leading me to something which I thought we may or may not come to. Do you mind if I go down a rabbit hole briefly? No, go for it. <laughs> okay, I, I don't know how esoteric your 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 listeners' sensibility is, but I will tell you that when I was, well, my parents are extraordinary humans. They, they've been endowed, let's say, with something extra that they never uh, encourage their kids to turn off. And I think that's one of the greatest gifts parents can give their children is to not shut off their valves of perception. So I was working with a palette that was broad and colorful already uh, when at 17 years old, I had what is called a near-death experience. And so what that experience gave me uh, upon my return was the sense that this is a continuum Life is not begun nor ended when the body expires. And what most humans fear, which is death, physical death, is nothing. What is something is death while you're living. 
Mm -hmm. To me, that means not living in, in allegiance and alignment with that greater mission or passion or spark that we touched on with, uh, with our first exchange. So what you're hearing actually is rooted in that experience. When, when one can locate why they're really here for themselves, I think it makes a lot of things easier. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, you, you touch on so many, so many important things. The idea that you know, no amount of, even though, even though the game seems to be to achieve these checkpoints, these bullet points on our resume or these awards and so on, the incapacity to be able to, to have compassion or, or, or understand what value that's connected to. The why and, behind it all. Well, yeah. And it sounds so simple. You know, the idea of value-based choices versus fear-based choices, which you touched on. They look the same, but they're completely different. They smell different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, it's it's um, you know, it's not about the end game; it's about the journey, isn't it? Well, certainly, but also, Larry Moss, who's a wonderful acting teacher and friend, would always say, "Show business is a bad parent." Mm. So there's nothing wrong with wanting Oscars and Tonys and all that fun stuff. No, but it depends on why. Yes. If one thinks. Again, this is an anodyne to, to what ails me, then the, it won't be big enough. You're going to need two Oscars and a Nobel Prize. Yep. But if you're in pursuit because it's fun and because who knows, maybe the platform allotted you with that Oscar win will allow you to amplify voices or stories that you feel need to be heard more. Yeah. So. I remember when I first landed in Los Angeles when I was a teenager, I worked three or so survival jobs a day. And one of them was as a janitor. Um, and sort of poetically, it was at a place that could have changed my life professionally in the realm of, of show business. Mm -hmm. So I was a janitor and um, I felt shame about that because it didn't meet the model of you know, flash discovery, which we, mm. we hear about. And also that mythology of, oh, you know, the cavalry is coming to rescue you from your bad choices. Not that being a janitor was a bad choice, but my way of thinking, my mindset was not aligned. Mm -hmm. And my father said, scrub the toilet with the same integrity as you would approach a role. Mm -hmm. And my whole life changed because I stopped compartmentalizing. Yeah. And that's when my vibration shifted. Mm -hmm. I would say that I carried a kind of poverty of the soul for a long time because I inherently, particularly growing up, never wanted people to feel alone with their pain. So as an empath and as an actor, I'd say, oh, I'll help you carry that. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't clear, number one, what was mine, what was others. And number two, I had skewered ideas about what success could possibly do to a person. So in preemptive avoidance of that, I said, I'll show you, I'll go without. It's hard for me, impossible, I would say, as a teacher to turn away a student who, who demonstrates genuine desire and, and heart hunger. Because I don't mean hungry ghosts, but I mean those mm. who I can see the fire in their eyes. It's not my place to deny their divinity. Um, and if I have something that can help them on their way, I in turn become part of their fabric. And it's all very laughable, right? Because I was watching a wonderful old movie last night with my aunt and uncle. And I thought, these humans who thought they were becoming immortal by being in motion pictures, they're all gone. And they're not really here to see it. it, it, it it's measured on a whole other uh, balance scale now for mm -hmm. them. They're, they're out of body. And uh, what they leave behind are these exoskeletons on celluloid, which, um, and we'll all be, we'll all be doing a version of that. We all leave behind the words, the moments. And when the last person who remembers us is gone, unless we've written something or put something on film, we're out of here. Mm -hmm. uh, the point being make a difference while you're here by activating the essence in others, by demonstrating that you're at home with your own. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Amen. Hope that made sense. <laughs> it, 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 you're awesome. You know, it makes perfect sense to me. You know, I'm really curious. Um, it stood out to me. You said, you know, that you're an empath and a helper and that you give pretty selflessly. As a giver, I'm so curious to know what value um, you connect the giving to. And subsequent to that question, was there a time when you felt that the reason for giving has changed the the attachment to the outcome oh, yes, or the, yes. Yeah. <laughs> very much yeah. so uh we're going to go deep um so first i want to transmute your first question so um when this experience happened at 17 for us we started to channel because it became very clear that there was intelligence larger than the thimble-sized brain <laughs> capacity <laughs> of a mere human that wanted to stream through Eric. And they're here now. Mm. Uh, so when you describe um, selflessness, first we want to offer the caveat that there are boundaries to that. So um, selflessness, when given without boundaries, is usually applied with a hook to receive something in return. Correct. Validation, love, etc. cetera. Yep. Um, we view th this giving, as you call it, as receiving, actually. Yep. Because with receiving, one must share. And share it being the operative word beyond giving or uh, taking. Mm. And synergy, synchronicity abounds in the as the frequency rises. Yes. You think of someone and there they are, or the phone rings and there they are, mm -hmm. or you think of someone and you feel moved to send an email in that moment and they say, how did you know? These are things one should take notice of. No, absolutely. There's no lack of evidence that your talent has been recognized and celebrated and appreciated. It's your bio, it oozes with accolades. Um, it's a who's who's list of impressive mentors who have clearly seen and supported your gift throughout your very impressive career, right? And, you know, what I was really struck with, I, at first I was very curious about how important, you know, listing all those things were. I also remarked that it led with a person and what somebody said about you. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't even say Eric is, but I'm just so curious to know where the intersection of who you're supposed to be as an actor, having already really done what you've done. Where do you go from here? Thank you for the question because you've brought more Eric back. It was funny because when you first were asking the question and you talked about uh, what you've done, quote, end quote, that seems very strange to spirit yep. because spirit is saying, no, no, <laughs> it's at best what you allowed us to do through you. Mm -hmm. Eric, me, can feel like not enough. Yep. And that psychologically certain people don't want to be the first buyer, so they need to know that other people have validated. Like, it's been very hard since the pandemic for me to find an agent. Mm. And so marketing materials were looked at by other people saying, well, Jesus, you know, you've worked with a lot of heavy hitters. You need to put that out there. I'm not want to promote that per se. Yeah. As an actor, I feel like a nobody, meaning professionally, my job is to be the blank slate I described in meditation. Mm -hmm. So at best I'm an allower. So it feels weird to take credit for some of those those things. Nevertheless, on paper, they're the exoskeleton that was described earlier that's mm -hmm. left on screen. So there is a fear construct in Hollywood, for instance, that we need to know that people, well, maybe it's not, I think it is to a degree fear-based, but it's also very tribal. It's also very human. People want to know that people they know, like, and trust have vetted you already. So I ask myself the same question that you just asked. What's more for me and the big shift has been that the pandemic really brought into focus how much I had lived my life as a tool in other people's toolkits, building other people's castles and their visions. 
Mm. Um, and as an actor, I was always a collaborator, but there's always that level of being a supplicant mm -hmm. to someone else's vision for the world. Mm. And we can see a lot of the slapback of, of those of us who said yes to something we didn't actually want to be complicit in, but thought this is the game, this is how we do it. I got to play along. Mm. And my identity was very tethered to who said yes. And what I noticed on my last three productions was that uh, in TV and in, in theater, I had things I devoted years to stripped away from me without so much as a thank you or a goodbye. I had moments that I thought were very revelatory in plays that someone sent a bootleg video of, and I'm not even lighted at that moment. Mm. Um, the, you know, I've contributed masses to other things things and it's maybe it doesn't even land on screen. The point of that is to say, it's not my story. Those aren't my stories to tell. That that was me in service of other people's stories. Mm -hmm. And all, all of this is leading to, we must be makers, we must be creators, we cannot complain about the narratives that are out there if we are not making ours. And so for the last year, I have developed a television series, a documentary, and a book. And I have been told for decades, stop waiting for the cavalry to come. You are the cavalry. To, these are borrowing phrases from, from Jay and Mark Duplass. Mm. Claim authorship and ownership of what is in that blueprint. Because if one looks back at those exoskeletons on the resume, you can see, oh, I've always been cast in these particular archetypes or these mm -hmm. particular stories. These are the roles that I tend to, these are the stories I tend to enhance with these roles. Use those as clues and then dare to pull the skin back on what you're here to light up and whose way you're here to light up. Mm -hmm. So that any misunderstanding between your talent and your audience is obliterated by you. Um, there. Uh, I want to say that it's very appropriate and important to work with masters and to be mentored. And I would not be here having this talk with you had I not been. But at some point, one must claim ownership mm. over their own narrative and set that free mm -hmm. into the world and, and not to try to marshal and control it and make it so perfect that it's inhuman. Mm -hmm. but to let the rawness emerge. You know, for me, I have a lot of friends acting now and I bless, I bless them. But every time that the email pops through with a self tape, you know, five to seven times a week, life stops and they just become machines. And if that's your game, more power to you. But I realized that I don't want to stop everything. I want to see these things through that I'm doing. I love acting dearly. I miss acting. I mean, I, I've acted in a few things over the uh, break, but I miss the, I ask myself what I miss. Do I miss the hunt? Do I miss the love that feels like it comes back? I love the feeling of it streaming through me when I go through all my fear and I go through all the not enoughness and I still walk to the edge of that cliff and kick my own ass off of it. Mm. That's what's thrilling because all the prep in the world is appropriate, but can't compare to the flight. And that I love. I, that's why the series and the doc and all these things, I'm in them all. <laughs> They're all part of that map yep. of my life. It's time to be unabashed about your offering. None of us know how long we get to be here. So take that into consideration. When you wake up in the morning and when you go to bed, nobody usually wakes up or goes to bed and saying, this is my last day on earth. It's our responsibility to see everything we can see. And only with that vision are we inspired to align and protect. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what the rainforest is, you just know that you get a ream of paper whenever you need it and you throw your plastic bag in the trash because you don't know where the Maldives are. And the fact that the, the water is swimming with your plastic bag and your floss, mm -hmm. then, then it's tunnel vision. Yeah. So that's our job as artists, as far as I'm concerned, and as human beings. 
peel our eyes open, open our ears up, open our hearts up and have the human experience. Mm, beautifully said. We've grown very selective about what we choose to see. Yep. And there is a moment, a magic moment in all of our lives on a daily basis when our eye leads us to something that it wants us to see. And very quickly, without even a conscious thought, we tip it away. Mm. And we say, basically, that's not important enough to be addressed now. We're hardwired to be, to be drawn towards things that threaten us. Mm. To things where we need to, to react. We, we respond immediately to those, even if, even if we've misinterpreted them, but our eye will be drawn to the shadow that, that we, that are, with, oh, that might've been someone jumping out of a bush at me or whatever. We'll notice those things, but would we notice a beautiful rose on the, on that bush? Yeah. And, and that's part of the trouble with cell phone technology is that so many are now looking down when they walk. Yeah. And uh, myself included. Yep. It's a very conscious decision either to not bring it at all or to say, I challenge you, Eric, to notice 10 beautiful things on this walk and you cannot return home until you have. And I don't mean just like lazily name something like something that genuinely moves you yeah when i go and work at universities with with uh acting uh students mm -hmm. i do certain exercises to create uh first-hand direct encounters with presence mm. and ensemble and um it's based on the principle is we cannot proceed unless we know we are whole mm. and, and whole doesn't mean complete means with a full cup enough to offer yeah and and i find human beings to be so extraordinarily beautiful particularly beings who often get overlooked yes i remember when i was that janitor he's still inside here um and a lot of other things that i did i remembered who didn't who didn't see me mm. who looked right through me because of my apparent station in life yep. and so now it's very, very important to me that everybody feel loved. It kind of leads me to what I, what I love to ask my guests, which is how do you want to be remembered? He made a difference. Hmm. And, and preferably a good one. Yeah. I've thought of that a lot, actually, because I, I have often felt that my human life would not be uh, the longest. And so I've always felt a kind of divine fever around using my days. If people can feel less alone having known me or the space that I can, that I hold, that's the best because my favorite thing when I'm surrounded by these students at university, I don't know their names and I won't remember much of anything about them or what even was shared for them through me. I see in their faces, mine, the suicidal teenager who chose to live another day and lived long enough to be able to encourage them to live. I, I meet these people all the time <laughs> on the street, you know, after a show, they'll say, do you remember me? And I say, no, and they say, I remember you because you taught me to live. You remember? In, in a one day workshop, I say, I, I didn't teach you to live. I didn't teach anybody to live. <laughs> they say, no, you, you helped give me a self that made me feel worth staying here to live. I said, I'm glad that that happened because actors did that for me. So I, it does strike me to the core. That's why I'm crying because it's such a sacred exchange. And that's why the art is to be honored. And um, as are our lives, you know, I am a big proponent of living your life as a work of art and not divorcing yourself from taking care of what you've got. Uh, I, th I see a lot of humans, particularly on the younger side of things, mistreat people and, and there's sort of an epidemic of not calling people back and 
not texting back and uh, sort of leaving that dangling. Grievance is unforgiven uh, or unamended and hiding, not wanting to run into someone uh, because they know, oh, I didn't finish that piece. So I make it a practice. I try to tell people I love them. I thank them. I'm, I'm grateful for them. I'm sorry. Please forgive me whenever and however I can. Uh, because I don't want to carry that burden with me as I live or when I do die of body. Um, and that to me is a prescription for wellness. Mm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you for your grace, really. Um, truly grateful. So I'd like to finish by playing a little game. It's uh, what makes you. Are you ready to play with me? Yeah. Let's do it. Yes. All right. So what makes you, da, 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 what makes you hungry? <laughs> hungry? Hmm. I'm getting the weirdest image. Uh, whales make me hungry. Um, and they make me hungry for size and ocean and having life and singing your song because whales have a single song that's their life song. And just the, the majesty with which they take space in the ocean and through peace, not abusive power. That makes me hungry to eat the sea and the light and, uh, and play in the waves and just honor what I am. Yeah. Beautiful. Strangest response you'll ever get. <laughs> no, not at all. No, actually, you know, what? Uh, that, the hungry thing is really fun because usually we've had, you know, pretty deep conversations and, and then I, I deliberately say hungry because I'm so curious to know a, if that'll just shift them and they'll go, they'll actually say, well, tacos or something, or if they'll, they'll try to come up with some, you know, great esoteric. <laughs> Oh, so, well, I mean, there's definitely foods that I hunger for, but that wasn't what you asked. No. And it's, it's beautiful because, you know, I'm, again, I'm not attached. I, it just, it's for me, it's a real signal to where they're at. And it's so fun. I, it's so much fun for me to ask that question. So I loved, I loved your answer. Oh yeah. There, there's one other visual. Yeah. There's one other thing that makes me very hungry in a similar way is riding on the back of a truck with a golden retriever. Hmm. Because when I see them eating the air, to me, it's like they're so hungry for life. I love that. It's just the ultimate freedom. Yeah, great images. Love that. What uh, what makes you sad? Uh, children who are uh, neglected by their parents, or or ch children who are used as props by their parents, and and it makes me sad because it falls then to the rest of the world to repair the being seen that the child was not. Mm. I'm saddened when I see children who are not seen. And so I always try to give them a little bubble of hello. Mm. So they're, they're delighted, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what inspires you children mm. and, um, humans, uh, who don't have all of the normal capacities that we consider part of the 100% physical package of being a human being. Mm. Mm. You know, the way that obstacles provide and provoke. And my also the other thing that brings me great joy are elders. Mm. I have three friends who are over a hundred years old oh, wow. and their perspective is extraordinary. And, and what matters now that to me, I love talking with elders because yeah. as my sister says, they're like sponges that are full and they need to be squeezed before they leave the planet. They need to know that their story had a reason for being. And so asking them that I receive so much. What makes you frustrated? What frustrates you? The last four years of government. What makes you laugh? <laughs> My mom. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> My mom is the funniest person on the planet. Yeah. I'm con convinced of that. And my great inheritance from her 
is this deeply irreverent sense of humor. Like, even, you know, listening to me talk about all this stuff and channeling and this, that, and the other, you'd think that I'm not like, I, I'm i just like the dirtiest joker, the most mischievous <laughs> fool. Um, and I love that. I love that sacred foolishness. Oh, toxic masculinity makes me laugh a lot. And I probably shouldn't say it, <laughs> but I just, I find it wildly entertaining. Um, <laughs> And, and and just so negligent in its affect that I have to laugh at it. Yes. So, uh, yeah. What makes you angry? Injustice comes to mind and also negligence, mm. negligent follow through. Uh, people who don't honor the time and mm. spirit of other people. I can't tell you how many times it's, it's obviously part of my, my soul map, but to experience being ghosted you know, when you show up 100% and that to not be able to afford to have enough self-respect and afford someone the dignity of your clean exit, mm. that pisses me off. I've gotten much better about it. Um, yeah. And finally, let me ask you, what are you grateful for? Everything. Mm. This moment, us, you, me, my parents, my family, my children which are my roles that I've played and the students I've worked with, yeah. nature, God, goddess, all that is flowers, trees, plants, animals, laughter, joy, sex, tears, feelings, spirituality, you name it. I'm grateful for having awoken this morning. And think about this. When you go to sleep tonight, mm. you have a heart that hasn't stopped beating since before you were born, there is no machine known to any of us that can function nonstop like that. And we have it as long as we have it. It's an extraordinary instrument and it's constantly working on our behalves, just as our lungs and everything else we're blessed to have. So never forget that we're on borrowed time living on the grace of this body machinery in order to have conversations like these through which hopefully something larger than this pinpointed focus of a single human being can flow. And I'm grateful for that. Mm. Yeah. Finally, what are the top three things that happened so far today? I woke up, <laughs> I spoke with you, and I had a glass of hot water with lemon in it from the garden. And all three of these things were terrific. Oh my gosh. Eric, I so appreciate you taking the time to be in the moment with me today. Really. I'm grateful for any opportunity to be in the moment, but especially with new friends who feel like old friends. Yeah. So thank you for asking because asking is one of the most powerful and humble things we can do. And it opens so many more doors than we're aware of. Yeah, absolutely. I've been speaking today with Eric Lieberman. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. And remember to live in the moment. In music, stop time is that beautiful moment where the band is suspended in rhythmic unison, supporting the soloist to express their individuality. In the moment, I encourage you to take that time and create your own rhythm. Until next time, I'm Lisa Hopkins. Thanks for listening.